First start of the video, I would like to apologise for my pronunciation of some of the places I've mentioned in the video. The Spanish Armada of 1588 Known for its failure, it has become very commonly known in history. However, very few people could tell you anything about the English Counter Armada that was just as if not more important than the attempted Spanish invasion. In April 1589, as a counter-attack the Spanish Armada, the English launched their fleet, trying to catch the Spanish off guard as their force had been massively cut down. They attempted to carry out three main objectives with this attack. Destroy Spain's Atlantic fleet, land at Lisbon, and cause a re re rebellion, and continue west, establishing a permanent base in Azores. If possible, they wanted to capture the Spanish treasure fleet returning from America, but they could only do that after carrying out the first three objectives. Their long-term goal was to end the trade embargo with the Portuguese Empire, making them ally with Elizabeth, increasing her potential for trade and therefore her power. This would be difficult as the current King Philip was accepted as king, so the English supported the pretender Antino Prior of Cato, the last living heir to the House of Aves. The plan was to launch the English fleet immediately, but they were too exhausted and unprepared as fighting off the Spanish Armada was a difficult and costly task. To add to this, Elizabeth didn't have the money. Also, just like the Spanish attack, the English planning was very optimistic and unlikely to happen. There were contradictions between plans, but all of them were unlikely to play out. The main priority was the Spanish fleet. Elizabeth ordered it to be destroyed as the main priority. As seen on the list, made on the 8th of April 1509, the fleet was made of Royal Galleons, English armed merchantmen, Dutch flyboats and other ships. Altogether there are around 180 ships, with each one having a crew of around 115 troops and marinas, 30 baggage, 10 horses, 10 vehicles, 2 munitions, 3 support and 7 pioneers. The list tells us that the Fuck. The list tells us that these ships were broken into five squadrons, led by Drake in the Revenge, Sir John Norris in the Non-Peril, Norris's brother Edward in the Foresight, Thomas Fencer in the Dreadnought, and Roger Williams in the Swiftsure. The fleet was manned by 23,375 people. On the 28th of April, the fleet set sail. Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex ended up sailing with them, even though he had been directly ordered by the Queen not to. He hid on the Swiftsure when he was betrayed when Norris told the Queen's courtier Francis Snollies where he was hiding. However, before he was caught, the Swiftsure quickly set sail away from Nollies, and he couldn't be followed as the Swiftsure had gone missing as it had hit strong winds and went off track. The English fleet sailed without them, and the Swiftsure made plans to meet back at Portugal. Drake and Norris's first target was Santander, where most of the surviving fleet from the Spanish Armada were being kept, where they planned to destroy the Spanish fleet. However, the fleet commanders and investors wanted to land in Lisbon, so Drake chose to ignore both of them, as the winds meant they could get stuck in the Bay of Biscay and chose to bypass Santander and go for Corona, a small fishing town in Galicia instead. It's not very clear why he did this, and the winds seemed like a poor excuse. Historians believe he either wanted to set up a base there or raid it. Whatever reason, this was their first major error. While crossing the bay, 25 ships with 3,000 men deserted, including many of the Dutch who returned to England. Corona was almost defenceless except one large galleon, San Juan, which had 50 cannons which was undergoing repairs, two galleys with 20 cannons each, and three smaller ships with between 18 and 27 cannons each. As well as this, the governor and garrison commander, Alva Tronsko, led a combined force of, tw of 1,200 militia Hidalgos and few available soldiers who had little combat experience and was also protected by city walls. The English entered the Bay of Corona and disembarked on the 4th of May. 
Lois took the lower part of the town, inflicting 5,000 casualties and plundering the wine cellars and fisheries, while Drake destroyed 13 merchant ships. The Paddock Spanish dismounted the guns from the San Juan to use on the English, then set the ship on fire. The English waited here for two weeks as the wind was blowing west and used this time to siege the other town. In between this, they had to dislodge Spanish attempts to carry on reinforcements through the bridge of El Burgo. Norris launched three major assaults against the walls and tried to breach them with mines, but the Spanish troops and women of the city forced them back with massive losses. The Princess and Diane managed to avoid capture and slipped past the English fleet, resupplying the defenders. On the 18th and 14 days of sieging, the English heard news of the Spanish relief force on their, on their way to Corona. Because favourable winds had returned, they abandoned the siege and ran away. The English had lost four captains, three large ships and more than 1,500 men. Drake left without even loading up supplies. The next stop was Portugal, and on the way they met with Essex and the Swiftsure, which had found its way back to the fleet. Fortifications in São Juliano, Rius, Capis, had been strengthened by May 20th, and Philip II's viceroy, Joan Goncaves de Antid, was tasked with recruiting local men to defend against the English. Also, Captain Pedro Encres de Guzman, Count of Fuentes, was ordered to bring a few Spanish companies. Meanwhile, Drake struggled against the wind. Three days after leaving Corona, a southwesterly wind caused part of the fleet to drift towards Esta de Barras and the coast of Lugo, leaving it somewhat dispersed. It wasn't until the 24th of May that the bulk of the fleet managed to sail beyond Cap Finister, where they came upon Essex and the Swiftsure, then, with a fable wind, headed to Lisbon. The next day, May 25th, just off the island of Bullings, they spotted Cape Roca, indicating that Tagus Estuary was not far off. By the end of the day, the fleet anchored in the Bay of Penice, where a war council was held. The next step in Elizabeth's plan was to arouse a Portuguese uprising against Philip II. The Portuguese aristocracy had recognised the latter as King Portugal in 1580 and thus added to the Kingdom of Portugal to the Hispanic monarchy. They pretended to the throne, who England supported, the prior of Crato, was not the best candidate. He did not have enough support even to establish a government in exile, or much charisma to back his already dubious claim. Despite this, Elizabeth had agreed to help him in hopes of diminishing the power of the Spanish Empire in Europe, and for a permanent military base in strategic Azores, from which to attack merchant ships and to obtain ultimate control of the commercial routes to the New World. In the wake of the experience in Corona, Drake and Norris clashed on how to achieve this next objective, despite Drake having proven success against the Spanish forces, whereas Norris had none, the fleet went with Norris's plan. They would land in Penisi, then march 70 kilometers south to attack Lisbon by land, while Drake attacked from the sea. This was the fleet's second major error. On the 26th of May, Drake arrived at Penisi. Tate had marshalled just over 400 troops in preparation for the fleet's arrival. He and his men knew the coastline well, and they were deployed in areas where land would be easiest, while Antonio de Arugio remained in a fortress at Penasi. The English, led by the Earl of Essex, took 32 barges to the most dangerous point of Costalongo Beach, which was completely exposed to the sea. The rocky coastline and deep water, 14 barges foundered, the other was smashed against the reefs. 80 men drowned, but the English managed to establish a beachhead where the first skirmish took place. Captain Benavidius immediately engaged some 2,000 invaders with 100 men. Ateda brought his 400 men and the Captain Blas de Jersey added another 80, while Perdo de Guzman stayed in the regard. Eight 
led three bloody charges, afterwards making an orderly withdrawal, leaving 14 Spaniards dead on a battlefield. Atier Ad and Guzman headed for the fort of Pinacy and discovered it was surrounded by the English. The only way out was to withdraw in the direction of the village of Antoki de Balaria and the fields outside the town. They camped for the night. The English had swept Lane like a hurricane and had landed 1,000. 12,000 men in a matter of hours. The English offered terms of surrender to Captain Arajiro, commander of the Penacy Fortress garrison, who responded he would only surrender to the pretender Dom Antonio, which he did. The same day, Archduke Albert ordered Alzonio de Bazin to bring 12 galleys with more infantry to San Julio. During the night, the men recruited by Atede deserted. The Spanish had their doubts about their Portuguese allies. They weren't exhibiting the expected favour against the invaders. There was no love lost regard to the prey of Cato. He not only squandered the Portuguese crown jewels, which he took with him when he fled the country, but he promised to Elizabeth the subjection of the Portuguese empire along with a permanent pecuniary payment. The impression made by the return of the pretender with an enormous invading army was conflicting. The Portuguese didn't rise up in revolt and joined the ranks as Dom Antonio had promised, but they weren't eager to be a part of the Spanish resistance either. The next morning, Captain Gaspar de Alcono led his Spanish cavalry on the surprise attack against the English flank, capturing a few prisoners, whereupon Guzman withdrew to the fortress of Torres Vendres and set Atere to report to their Archduke in Lisbon. Norris had stationed 500 men with six ships in Penishi. Then the English began their long march to Lisbon on the 28th of May without artillery or baggage train, making provision problematic. But Don Antonio assured them that the locals would provide whatever the army needed. The English had very strict orders not to upset the inhabitants, but housebreaking and pillaging was arrived once at clear of Penishi. Norris ordered Captain Crisp, the provocist marshal, to hang the perpetrators, including the officers. As they approached, Torres Vedres, Guzman, and Don Shallow Bravo, who brought more cavalry and infantry, withdrew to Enzrax dos Cavalerios, some two leagues away, while Antron stayed behind to harass the enemy and report their actions. Dom Antonio made his triumphal entry into Torres Vedres on May 29th with much fanfare from the people, the English commanders and nobles noticed something was off. They realised that Portuguese nobility were not amongst the revellers, in fact they were nowhere to be found. These were precisely the individuals who among the conscripts were set the example for the population to rise up in favour of the prior of Cato. The English pressed Cato about provisioning, whereupon the latter had sent soldiers to fetch the law. The Gaspar Camillo lived nearby and put him in charge of providing the army. Campello had no better success in gathering provisions since the local population were leaving with their possessions and supplies, thus leaving the road to Lisbon devoid of victuals. Meanwhile in Lisbon the population was fleeing with much of their movable property in anticipation of the English overrunning the city, thus leaving the defence of the city to the Spaniards. On the 30th of May, Drake reached the port of Cassius and anchored his fleet between its citadel and that of San Julio in a crescent formation as close to the coast as possible. He also ordered raiding vessels to scour the waters of the nearby coastline and the Billers Islands for the enemy ships. Meanwhile, the English army, continually harassed by the Spaniards during their arduous journey, reached Laura's barely 10 kilometers from the walls of Lisbon. Though their perilous journey was behind them, the Spanish would not allow them to enjoy much rest for their camp continued to be attacked and any supplies cut off. Norris's army was getting hungrier by the minute. Little did the English know that it was just outside the city walls with vast stocks of supplies. Fearing the enemy would attack the next day and discover the storehouses along the way, the Archduke ordered Captain Don Juan de Torres to keep them occupied. On 31st May, while the provisions were brought into the city, 
And if the Torres could conflict losses on the English, all the better. Through the Spanish tried to coax the English into coming out of their trenches, the latter wouldn't move. Meanwhile, so as to deny the English any provisions, what remained from the storehouses after bringing what they could into the Lisbon was set ablaze. Because the English were not willing to come out and answer the Spanish course of battle, Captain Julius de Torres, Sergio Bravo, Gaspar de Aldecran, and Francis Mallo selected 200 elite troops supported by some cavalry and carried out a uh, camisado. Lieutenant Colonel Son Sampson Camp was selected as the target for this mission. The Spanish approached camp at dawn on Thursday the 1st of June. C Corpus Christi Day shouting Viva el, el Rey Dom Antonio meaning in Spanish Long Live Dom Antonio. The moment they were admitted into the camp the guards were killed then several soldiers sleeping in their tents were killed before the alarm was shouted. The English hurriedly formed a makeshift defence line where their compatriots were being massacred. Harley, Harvey's fire ripped in both sides and Don Juan de Torres was wounded in the arm. He died from it three weeks later. The Spanish made a hasty retreat suffering a few casualties. While the English continued to rest and starve, the men found the weather too hot and exhausting. Many were weak from hunger, sick and injured and needed to be carried on bandaged mules and stretchers made from pikes. The Archduke called a war council. The Portuguese commanders pointed out that since they were expecting relief troops to arrive any day, the city walls were tall and strong and they could easily be supplied from the Tagus while the English were suffering from hunger and sickness. They decided to bring the army within the city walls and make their stand there. Before the end of the day on June 1st, the English were in Alvaid, less than an hour away, forming up pike squadrons. Atop a high steep mountain in Lisbon is the imposing and threatening castle of São George, which commands an extraordinary view of the city and its Envians. Installed within were new, largely reinforced bronze cannons with extra thick barrels pointed towards the English camp. The gunners needed to test the range for their new guns and found this a good time. Just as the English rearguard was leaving Alvite on the 2nd of June, the vanguard came within 2,000 metres and the guns were fired, causing surprise and inflicting casualties for Norris's army. They quickly realised they had been contended with this threat for as long as they were within the range, so a more suitable route with the better cover was chosen to approach the city. Meanwhile, the Spanish had set fire to the houses built adjacent to the city walls, thus forming a makeshift Bulquoir and Bazan, which was ordered to bring 12 galleys from Sardouan to the city. The English found a suburb that was suitably protected from the castle's artillery and that of a gateway where they could where they camped for the night. The rest was unsettled by a Spanish sortie, leaving some English casualties in the field. When the troops tried to rest, plans were made to effect a superstitious entry into the city. One Portuguese noble still loyal to Dom Antonio was Rui Dias Lobo, who took a message to the abbot and friars of the Monastery of the Holy Trinity, which was built against the weak section of the city wall, asking for permission to use the monastery as an entry point for the English soldiers. Since the Catholic friars were fully informed of the Protestant English treatment of Catholics, they discreetly relayed this plan to the Spanish, who turned arrested and imprisoned Dios Lobos. Another plan centred around a diversionary tactic and the betrayal of one of the Portuguese nobles, Matias de Alpunias, who was in charge of one of the gates. Nothing came of this. The third and least credible plan was the inhabitants who rebelled the moment Dom Antonio had reached the walls of Lisbon, thus keeping the Spaniards inside the walls busy while the English entered without difficulty. None of these plans worked. At dawn on the 3rd of June, the English readied themselves to mount an assault on the western side of the city wall. In anticipation, the Spanish stationed top marksmen on the roofs 
of churches just outside the northwestern section to reinforce the western wall. The houses outside the gate of, San Can of Santa Calantia were set on fire to prevent them from being used to scale the wall. The English then headed south towards the sea where preparations had been made for them. The houses there had also been burnt and the galleys were in position to rain fire down on them. When Norris finally got a good look at the vast outskirts of Lisbon and sheer size of the city, he could only but reflect. He had no artillery to smash through the wall, nor scale another to climb over the wall. In fact, he had no siege equipment of any kind. Moreover, his army's numbers were decreasing from hour, hour to hour, and those unable, none who was able to fight were weakened by hunger. The expected uprising by the Portuguese loyal to the Croato never materialised, and Norris reluctantly admitted to himself that this campaign was a failure. The only option was to go on the defensive and withdraw to their trenches. This was the moment where the table turned and the Spanish went on the offensive. Three simultaneous attacks were launched by the Spanish. One of the nearest trenches in the very streets of the suburbs of one of the rear guard and the candidate from the castle of Sao George. The English suffered hundreds of losses, whereas the Spanish left 25 dead. The Spanish were expecting several thousand reinforcements on forced marshes to arrive at any time and were continuously resupplied via the river, whereas the English were out of power, powder and match. The latter spent the day on the 4th of June burying their dead and planned a uh, plastic nocturnal retreat to Cassius. To deceive the Spanish, they lit several bonfires in the campsite and kept them lit while a bulk of the infantry quietly ran away along a route away from the water and away from the main roads so as not to be discovered. Meanwhile, the Archduke planned a faint attack on the English camp because it seemed really peculiar to him that they hadn't made any offensive moves that entire day. He ordered that at midnight, the men in the galley sent 2,000 lit match cords on skiffs to land on the shore near the English camp. Normally lit match cords at night would give away one's position, but in this case it was intended to make the English believe they were about to be attacked. It was purely a coincidence that this ruse result in the enemy thinking the retreat had been discovered, causing them to make a disorderly haste. As dawn broke on the 5th of June, Bazian's galley spotted the enemy movement and opened fire, which awakened Lisbon. Upon determining that the enemy withdrawal was complete and not a trick, the Spanish set out in pursuit. The galleys followed the English infantry, firing all the while. When they approached Cassius, Sancho Bravo and Alconia attacked the English column, inflicting hundreds more casualties. When the English completed the march from Lisbon to Cassius, they lost about 500 people along the way. On the 6th of June, the Count of Fluentes marshalled an army in Lisbon to march on Cassius so as to inflict as many casualties as possible. They spent the night in Aureus. When they reached the English trenches in the morning of June 7th, 7th, they were met with cannon fire from Drake's fleet. A council of war decided it was a bad idea to launch any sort of direct assault on the English on the way back to Lisbon. Fluentes stopped off at the castle of Sao Julian to consult with Bazan. They arranged to keep the enemy isolated to Cassius, essentially besieging them. On the morning of the 8th of June, the Earl of Essex championed the bit Chief Glory and angry with the lack of success of the slow spineless army, arranged to have a trumpeter bring to the Spanish a message challenging them to open combat. The message read, We the generals, Drake and Norris, and the Earls of such and such, having been informed that the Count of Fluentes, General of the Kingdom of Portugal and others on his side, have said that we retreated and fled in secret from Lisbon and not in the manner of an army intended to fight. Hereby state that we have not fled, so that it may be known by our deeds that we are ready and willing. We are sending you this trumpeter with our challenge and informing you that we, w we, that we await you on this field of Aureus to s offer battle until the end of the day. The message was shown all courteousness in accordance with the rules of hospitality, then sent back with the message being unopened. <laughs> 
shortly thereafter, the most important Portuguese arist aristocrat, Don Tudio II, seventh Duke of Braganxia, arrived in Lisbon with 20 noblemen, including his brother, Dom Dwight of Braganxia, Marcus of Fregica, and his personal guard of 70 harbingers and 200 lanciers and a thousand infantrymen. His arrival not only brought reinforcements to defend Lisbon, it also solidified the Catholic Union while leaving Dom Antonio looking a little more like a fugitive. While Drake was angered in Cassius, he seized several wheat laden Euclid, giving him a veritable inexhaustible supply source. They engaged the nearby mills to grind wheat into flour from which bread was made. On June 9th, Fuentes sent Captain Francisco de Valesco with a small division of infantry and cavalry to destroy those mills, eliminating the usefulness of their vast amounts of wheat for making bread. They resorted to boiling the wheat in order to eat it. On June 10th, Francisco Cullum inventory the enemy vessels anchored at Cassius as counting 147. And important that he added that though they continued to threaten to attack the entrance of the estuary, he didn't believe that they actually would for a few days. They had the most optimal weather and tides to do so if they wished to. Then on the 11th of June, Captain Francisco de Carres, commander of the castle of Cassius, received a visit from two Franciscan mon monks from the monastery of San Antonio, Solomon and Vowen, that Lisbon had surrendered to Dom Antonio. Three days earlier, it would be a mortal sin to keep fighting when all hope was lost. Several days prior, Cassius had sent two soldiers to request more men and ammunition from Lisbon, who were never heard from, nor had any news from Lisbon, so he had no reason to doubt the monks. James. He surrendered the castle without a fight, obtaining honourable terms, leaving with 50 men, banners and weapons, even and even given a ship to set sail to Sepulchre. Within the castle were plenty of supplies and ammunition and 14 cannons. Upon his arrival in Sepulchre, Kellius was arrested and then beheaded. <laughs> Each day passed, the Spanish Portuguese, aka Iberian army, was growing stronger while the English were dwindling, observing the odd passive conduct of the enemy fleet. Lisbon still thought the English would retreat to launch a combined group and sea attack on the 13th of June. The Count of Villadora, general of the Portuguese cavalry, had stationed a strong detachment near Cassius, and the next day the Duke of Blanquilla joined his forces to complete the siege by land. Meanwhile, the Aldentio of Castile, Martin Palladia, arrived in São Juliano with 15 well-equipped guys to reinforce those of Bazan, thus completing the siege by sea. The English finished embarking that night. Everything was ready on the 16th of June to launch a major offence against the English, assuming the weather cooperated, which it didn't, so the attack was delayed. Also that day, two small vessels arrived from England, bringing correspondences from the Queen dated May the 20th, and news that 17 supplier vessels, but no troops were en route. Most of the ships had earlier abandoned the fleet. Those supply ships arrived on June 17th or 18th, commanded by Captain Cross. In her letters, the Queen ordered the immediate return of her favourite Essex and vehemently criticised Drake and Norris for how badly they conducted the expedition thus far, especially for not going to Santander to destroy the remnants of the Spanish Armada, despite the favourable winds to do so. All Drake could think of was leaving Portugal and quickly as possible to achieve some sort of victory, but the wind wasn't cooperating. It didn't cooperate on the 17th of June either. In the several days that the English Armada was anchored off Cassius, Drake had collected numerous merchantmen, and the day before they sailed, a fleet of 20 French and 60 Hispanic ships were captured in the mouth of the Tigers. That seizure notes R.B. Wenham that was a useful blow to the Spanish preparations, but later required a public print and justification. On the morning of the 18th of June, despite the unfavorable wind, Drake finally decided to set sail away from the coast with his fleet and the captured merchantmen, totaling some of 210 ships, which is when Essex escorted some 30 Dutch merchant ships, which were discharged, thus ending the participation in the expedition. 
So as to placate the, his queen, Drake decided to try and capture the treasure fleet in the Azores, but not being able to set sail west, the winds pushed him south-southwest, staying within sight of the Portuguese coast. Meanwhile, the Iberian troops who arrived in Cassius after the English departure found it an utter shambles. Part of the castle had been blown up, the entire town sacked and the church was desecrated. It was so dirty and unlivable that Fuentes ordered the garrison to, to billet an adjacent town until it had been cleaned up. The Adelanto set off in pursuit of the English Armada with nine galleys on the 19th of June. While in Lisbon, 15 carvels with extra men and munitions were being ready to reinforce the Azores. The first engagement at sea was in the morning of the 20th of June, resulting in a loss of 9 to 11 English ships, two smaller boats, and the dispersion of the fleet. By the end of the day, Drake had managed to reassemble much of his fleet. Young William Fenner, who had came with his 17 supply ships, commanded by Captain Cross, was separated further after the storm during the night and found himself headed towards the archipelago of Madeira, ultimately anchoring in a port of Santo, where the next day seven more English vessels joined him. They took the island and resupplied themselves over the next two days. Unable to find the rest of the fleet, they set sail for England. The English prisoners captured by the Iberians following the 20th of June battle revealed that the fleet had no provisions, making an adventure to the Azores unlikely, so the Iberians shifted their attention to the 500 mile garrison north that left at Penasi on the 28th of May. Drake had made his way up to the Portuguese coast against the wind to achieve those men, while Guzman Bravo rushed Theta with his cavalry. The, later, the latter arrived on the 22nd of June, making a surprise attack just as the garrison started to embark on the small ship, killing the captain some 300. Take, tackling his way north along the Portuguese coast, Drake arrived at Pedersey. The next day, hopping to pick, the, pick up the garrison, only to be met with cannon fire from the fortress. He sailed off the next day. 24th of June, a favourable northeast wind came up and Drake set off for the open sea. Yeah, amazingly seemed headed for Azores. Drake struggled against the wind, tackling his way to Virgo. Over the next five days, tossing the dead overboard by the hundred, finally arriving within sight of the undefended small fishing town on the morning of the 29th of June. By nightfall, around 133 ships had anchored off Brazil's Virgo and Tis with 20 vessels guarded the area around the Sears Islands. Since it was too late in the day to start a landing, they waited until the next morning, which gave the Spaniards time to evacuate the town. Their strategy was essentially to divide and conquer. They expected the English to enter the town as a cohesive group, but after seeing the town empty of the people and valuables, they will eventually spread out across the outskirts where um, ambushes were waiting for them. Come dawn on June 30th, the English came ashore in three different locations with around 2,000 men and were at once stunned and disappointed to find the town completely deserted. Incensed by the defeat in Corona and Lisbon, they showed no mercy to Virgo. Destruction started with the Armada's cannons following by Icolosians but burned the churches, then setting the rest of the town ablaze. Surrendering to their desires for wanton destruction gave them a dangerous sense of confidence that allowed their greed to take over and sent them to disperse in search of food and loot. There are a few skirmishes that day. A few hundred invaders were killed, but the main purpose of the land was to refill the water casks, which went on during the chaos. The next day, the 1st of July, Don Luis Samerta showed up with a sizable Spanish force catching the English unawares, killing hundreds and capturing prisoners. Drake quickly ordered his men to re-embark. They sent a dispatch promising to leave the estuary without causing further harm on condition the prisoners were returned. When the Spanish commander saw the totality of the devastation, he had the prisoners hanged within views of the fleet and challenged Drake to send more Englishmen so he could hang them all. The next morning, Drake sailed out the estuary, with most of the fleet leaving Norse behind with some 30 vessels, as he was further up the waterway and couldn't make it out before a storm hit. Two of Drake's ships were captured that day. One ran aground and two more were smashed against the rocks near Cangus. On the 3rd of July, Drake still struggled against the wind on his way to Fischer, while Norris still anchored off Sears Island had the artillery removed from this ship that ran aground and then set it ablaze. The latter was able to leave on Sears on, on July the 4th. 
Spain saw the last English fleet on the 5th of July as it struggled against the wind to go back to England. Captain Diego de Amula was dispatched from Santander with a flourish of Zabras to chase the English fleet nearby back to its home shores. From this point on it became more difficult to follow the path of the Armada since information is, o is only available for a small number of vessels. But what there is is shockingly grim. Thomas Fenner's 500 ton dreadnought set off with nearly 300 sailors and returned with only 18 fit to work. The rest were dead or diseased, including Fenner. Of the crew of the Griffin, the Lubeck, only five or six men were were well, but too weak to hoist the sails. The rest were dead, including the captain, or deceased. Out of the 50 soldiers who were aboard, 32 or 33 had to be cast overboard. Two more died as they landed in Sandwich. Drake's flagship, the Revenge, sprung a leak from the storm damage and almost foundered as she left the remainder of the fleet home to Plymouth, where she docked on the 10th of July. Norris landed in Plymouth on the 13th of July and immediately conspired with the Earl of Essex and Anthony Ashley to cover up the extent of the disaster and even go so far as to try to spin it into a triumph. The next day, Norris sent a letter to Washington, Washington admitting the failure and drawing the latter into the conspiracy, thus making him a co-conspirator. On July the 17th, a reply to the falsified reports arrived from Elizabeth, expressing the delight with a happy success of the expedition. Following Norris's initial report, a cascade of propaganda erupted immediately, with the most detailed account in English, written in the form of a letter by an anonymous participant, published in 1586. A true copy of, dis of a discourage written by a gentleman employed in the late voyage of Spain in Portingate which unbashedly set out to restore the credit of the participants, but it could not conjure away the utter failure of the campaign. Because the English Armada was such a big failure, you may not have heard of it, because the English tried to cover it up. And that is why it's not a, as big a historic event as the Spanish Armada is. And it's, this just shows how poorly it went, that they had to try to erase them from history. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, as you probably will enjoy more of my videos. This has been a bit of a long video, and I would like to apologise for anything I've mispronounced, or if I've said something totally wrong. I don't speak Spanish, so... But, thank you. If you want me to cover a topic, please be, feel free to leave in the comment section below, as I would love to, to see that you care. Thank you.